your life. Okay. So, hey, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody, uh, depending on the time zone. Uh, this is Daniel, and what we're going to take a look on today is tokenization a little bit like deeper. Uh, so it's going to be, I would say, deep dive. Uh, I just try to, to collect as much as much deeper inside in, in tokenization as possible. Uh, it's it's a pretty much you know, I mean I mean improve improving topics. So basically, uh, there's there's no chance to getting the state of the art knowledge. Uh, I mean it's, it's changing practically day to day. Uh, so from perhaps just a couple of words from my side, uh, I'm a software architect uh, specializing uh, to different uh, blockchain topics. I got like two major major directions. One is um, the more classical, like consortium blockchain applications, like like Hyperledger Fabric, for instance, and well, I would say then basically everything which which depends uh, depends or, or which is related somehow to Hyperledger. And I got another direction as well that's more like uh, public blockchain and especially in solidity style programming. Um, so I wouldn't say just on Ethereum because even if I mean if you have like Ethereum. Um, you know, I mean, Solidity is used not just with Ethereum applications, but like different other ones as well, like with Polygon, for instance, and stuff like that. So in this sense, I just try to combine these two two fields, two experiences from my side, and then then deliver practically a good presentation. Uh, so the agenda for today, uh, I don't plunge right away into the into the deepest, I mean, void of of tokenization. Um, I would just start with like like free free chain evolution. The second one is is like token basics. So what is what is tokens at all? Uh, then basically, I will have some use cases for tokens, but I will just cover pretty fast. And then after that, I'm just try to to invo include some some more interesting topics like some points of view what is what is a blockchain tokens um that is somehow related to other sf representations and how we can combine such such topics such fields then we got some 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 slides from token standardizations then of course i got one slide from basic token types but it's not something that i'm going to cover very deeply and then after that i will just cover a couple of different uh, further top token types. I mean, I mean beyond like simple NFT or simple fungible. So we get like different NFT style token types, which are not really uh, NFTs, but something more complicated than some 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 token types that are so related somehow to fungible tokens. But again, they are just more complicated that, than a simple ERC twenty token. So that's the agenda for today. I think it's gonna be like 40, 50 minutes. Um, my network is sometimes a little bit unstable, so. It might happen that I will just go offline for like 20 seconds. Uh, I hope it, it won't uh, cause big problems. Uh, but yeah, in case, yes, then, you know, I mean, if you see me go offline for 20 seconds, then that's basically you know, a possibility to have a coffee and then have a very small break. Uh, my proposition is basically that, so I will cover the slides as, as fast as possible. Um, if if you don't understand something, then then please please feel free to to stop me and have have like a, a short clarifying question. Uh, but basically, for longer discussions like question and answers, I I just uh, plan to have like more time at the end. So again, it's uh, we just uh, planned for one and a half hours. Again, my the presentation is, I guess it's like like 40, 50 minutes. So after that, uh, we're gonna have a plenty of time. Of discussing uh, different things uh, if it is needed. Awesome. So let me start uh, with some basics. Uh, let me start with blockchain evolution. So it looks that way uh, basically that somehow blockchain started with Bitcoin. And the next topic or the next uh, basically milestone was Ethereum. And Ethereum caused like a little bit splitting uh, in terms of innovation. Um, we get two parts of inno innovation, and one is, uh, you can see it here below, that's kind of an infrastructure innovation, which is, which is happening and which is, uh, I, mean, I mean, requires a lot of um, very exciting theoretical background. Um, I mean, if I say infrastructure innovation, I usually mean by, by scaling practically, I mean, scaling is one big topic. We got like two big areas of scaling, uh, like layer one scaling and layer two scaling. 
uh, scaling practically tries to improve somehow blockchain performance. So, I mean, it means we got more transactions, faster transaction, uh, instead of kind of a stochastic uh, settlement, uh, final settlement and stuff like that. Uh, if I say infrastructure innovation, um, we get some, some other fields as well. I mean, one other part of infrastructure innovation is privacy, which is again, very theoretical, uh, very cool thing. I mean, in terms of infrastructure innovation, which, which are hot topics at the moment, are roll-ups and of course, zero knowledge proof and, and privacy, of course. Uh, these are all infrastructure innovation. But perhaps what's important to note that there's a kind of an application innovation uh, happening in the blockchain space. And this is so more or less independent from the infrastructure one. I say more or less, uh, probably on the long run, it's gonna be more, more independent. At the moment, it's not so much uh, independent, but it's getting to be ind independent. And if I mean like application innovation, I mean that uh, which which are the building blocks of a blockchain application, uh, that part is, is being innovated as well. So like one topic of these application building blocks is basically tokenization and tokens, uh, and it's getting to be standardized. And it's again, so at the moment, the idea is somehow that, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, whole tokenization comes from the Ethereum, from the Solidity world, but it's it's getting to be more and more independent from the Ethereum world. So, like, if we say like NFT, then then we can actually consider NFT in many different platforms, not only with Solidity and not only with like uh, like Ethereum style blockchains. And this tokenization, uh, I guess, it's gonna be a very very uh, important building blocks uh, block of the future uh, application innovation of of the different uh, the different uh, blockchain spaces, uh, and then at the moment it's like core building blocks of DeFi of decentralized finance. Uh, but I guess on the long run, like tokenization might be core building blocks of like different you know, I mean consortium ledgers and consortium ledger applications and CBDC perhaps uh, as well. Uh, so just like a little bit like like background. So I say uh, basically, I mean this tokenization started somewhere in Ethereum, uh, but if you just check the news, uh, for instance, uh, this tokenization might be imagined on different blockchain platforms, and it can be imagined on different blo non-blockchain platforms as well. So if you just um, have the news, the latest news for for instance, the Swift which is certainly uh, not not necessarily so innovative and absolutely non-blockchain platforms. So Swift is ex more and more independent from the underlying settlement layer, from the underlying uh, blockchain layer. Just one more hint, for instance, uh, if you if you i mean we are we are at hyperledger here so if you have like hyperledger fabric hyperledger fabric is is more on the consortium is more a consortium ledger um so perhaps this tokenization is not so strong at the moment as with public blockchains but if you just check for instance the fabric samples repo then even hyperledger fabric having some tokenization initiatives as well so if you just fabric check fabric fa fabric samples, for instance, then we can find like uh, ERC20, ERC, uh, which is a fungible token, ERC721 or ERC1155 ERC tokens, which are fungible, non-fungible, and, and kind of hybrid fungible and non-fungible tokens. Uh, so yeah, so that's the direction. And again, it is not, doesn't exactly look like at the moment that these tokens are totally independent from the, from the underlying blockchain platforms but i mean i would expect that on the long run we're gonna have like independent standards uh which are token standards and can be actually executed on any kind of settlement layer including blockchain or perhaps non-blockchain ones as well so that was a brief uh, blockchain evolution introduction so let me just continue what is actually a token so again, um, it's mostly based on the public uh, tokenization efforts. 
but I would say a token is basically a building block of, of for any decentralized protocol or any decentralized application, or on the long run, perhaps any kind of perhaps not so decentralized, but like semi-centralized applications as well. So it is a building block in two sense. Uh, on the one hand, it is it is kind of an internal building block. So if you build up an application, uh, you're gonna have like many different tokens uh, inside. Uh, on the one the other hand, it's it's kind of an interface. Um, so if you just like want to combine two protocols, uh, two blockchain applications, uh, then you have kind of an interface between these these two applications. And this in, this interface itself is a token. So I mean it's a cool thing uh, because it's not just a technical interface uh, between two between two platforms between two protocols or decentralized applications, but it's kind of a business logic interface as well. It's a, it's a good cooperation uh, technique, I would say. So what is a token basically? Uh, uh, it's it's pretty pretty difficult to define. So there's there's no exact definition uh, on a token. Um, you can imagine token as a poker chip. Uh, so these are like the poker chips uh, on the right. Uh, you can have like, like many different, uh, many different size of poker chips. This can, this can be different uh, based on color, size, amount and, and other properties as well. And these tokens, which are somehow uh, represented by the ledger, uh, by the distributed ledger. Uh, so it's important to note what blockchain realizes based on these tokens, so these tokens moving somehow on the blockchain, uh, what blockchain realizes is a, is a kind of quasi ownership of these tokens. Uh, and I say quasi uh, because it, it kind of a surprising fact that that's kind of a cryptographic ownership. Um, and this is, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna see some slides about uh, that later on, but if I say cryptography, uh, that's a little bit different ownership than, for instance, a legal ownership or a physical ownership. So what blockchain does uh, related to these tokens is to realize a kind of crypt cryptographic ownership. If you have the private keys and if you can sign kind of a transaction or or, or kind of a kind of a proof uh, that that you own these tokens, then you can do something with these tokens. Uh, that's what I mean by cryptographic ownership. So for instance, I mean, two typical applications are like transferring tokens or exchanging tokens. So if you sign practically something uh, that proves that you own the tokens, again, with a kind of a pro, uh, private key, then you can transfer these tokens practically. And your settlement layer is the blockchain for the first run. Again, uh, on the longer run, it, we might as well imagine we get some, some other settlement layers as well. Another use is like, Aging tokens, if you just do each one for another one. Again, it, it, it works pretty similarly. So, so for this exchange, I need to sign something with my private key that proves that I own the token uh, in a cryptographic sense, and then I can exchange tokens practically. So the implementation is usually smart contracts and, and of course uh core blockchain functionalities. So we got we got something as as native tokens as well. So I just break a little bit. Uh, so just one second. So let me continue. That was like a basic token or token definition. Um, so some of the basic token use cases are, uh, we got we got different block, uh, blockchain uh, or token use cases. Uh, there's actually several different ontologies for that. Uh, so I just give some examples. Uh, we use tokens for cryptocurrencies. So actually a cryptocurrency is kind of a token uh, which which usage is, is meant to be like payment. Uh, it's another thing uh, how much a cryptocurrency can behave as a payment or not. But anyway, the major idea was for a cryptocurrency to, to work as a payment. Uh, then we got stable cryptocurrencies. Uh, these are like more position position things, uh, more position tokens in terms of realizing the payment service, uh, for instance. Then we got like platform tokens, like for instance, in Ethereum. 
Uh, in Ethereum, I mean, Ether is a platform token of Ethereum. It practically works. I mean, it's a, it's a basic basic economic building block of your system. So, um, so the idea is that Ethereum practically is like a like a like a like a like a market with two roles. One role is practically giving uh, wanting to validate transactions and giving some transaction fee on that. And the second part is basically, or the second role is like maintaining the network in terms of mining or validation, more like it in Ethereum. And they collect, of course, the uh, the transaction fees. And Ether is is meant to be the, I mean, the economic connection between these these two roles, these two parties. Uh, so that's that's why basically the system works. Uh, otherwise, it it couldn't. Then one important thing is like security token tokens or more like tokenized securities um so it's it's more like a legal term um yeah most people you know, i mean most ICOs wanted to have like like utility tokens but sometimes from a legal perspective these tokens are 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 characterized as as financial securities and another in interesting point that if we get like tokenized securities like like having stocks or bond for instance on the blockchains then we get like utility tokens. Utility tokens are like be basic building blocks of, of diff different decentralized applications on the blockchain. Uh, we get like governance tokens. Governance tokens are, are used practically for voting on change on different protocols on different applications. And we get many, many other uh, use cases like we can have like representing natural resources on the blockchain, like carbon credit for instance or or carbon emission and of course recently we got like many like cbdc use cases as well so this is one field of one part of 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 examples of use cases on the other hand we had like like more like the nft style use cases like tokenization of physical art so if i want to, want to tokenize like a mona lisa and uh, and the picasso that's like kind of a tokenization of, of physical art there's a brand new movement of of having virtual art uh, on on the internet, uh, which is of course pretty much hyped because I mean until this point, there there was no chance of 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 selling virtual art, art I mean fully digitized art uh, on the internet uh, because 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 there was there was no point of of having like one token uh, on that um, which could be sold. Um, so it's an interesting movement then then digitizing art practically on the blockchain then uh, of course i mean tokens are used very very much in in like gaming uh and it, and it it tends to be used very much in the metaverse for instance so one idea for instance is that uh metaverse is not just like virtual reality but practically a virtual reality which is combined very strongly uh, with with a, with a very strong tokenization movement as well. So, like uh, virtual properties in tokens, in virtual uh, in VR games, in, in metaverse, for instance, that's an that's an emerging uh, that's an emerging field. Uh, of course, I mean it gets hype and then it has some bubbles as well uh, without questions. So, market goes up, market collapses. Uh, but you know, I mean that's that's the way how how basically public blockchain things work. Uh, then we got a lot of tokenization in gaming in like role role playing gaming um we might as well speak about like physical property uh tokenization like token tokenizing the house for instance or, or perhaps a car uh then we have we have very strong uh, tokenization in defi protocols but it's you know i mean it's pretty much defi is actually based on tokens so it's not surprising there are there are many tokens in defi and of course, the classical example are like crypto collectibles. So the the uh, the one of the original use case uh, for NFT, for instance, was like crypto kitties or or crypto punks. So these are some basics of organization. And then uh, what I'm gonna cover now a little bit in more in details is is to clarify that um, so we should distinguish somehow free representations uh free representations of assets or asset representation and i think it's important to distinguish uh these three different representations uh because if we don't do there are like like many many misunderstanding uh based on that so if we have like like asset representation uh let's have 
a classical legal asset representation. So, so basically, a legal representation is, is something that which is a legal ownership. I legally own, for instance, a house. Uh, it means I got some legal contract, for instance. I can sell my house basically in a way that, that I sign my contract uh, and then uh, and then, then some, somebody is going to be the, the, new, uh, the new owner. Or I have my car, basically, uh, which means that I, I somehow legally uh, own this car uh, and then basically I can transfer my ownership, basically, and then give this ownership, give my car to, to somebody. So it's important this kind of a legal or institutional asset representation, uh, which works that way. I got the legal ownership, I got legal legal contract, and basically, basically the settlement layer of this of this legal ownership or or institutional ownership is practically the law or the legal system. So this is like one big area. The second one is is something which is a physical or tangible uh, asset representation. I would say. Um, that means practically that I physically own, I physically have, have something. Uh, for instance, I, I have my car uh, or I have my, I don't know, uh, Apple, for instance, I hold it in my hand, uh, which, which means practically that's physically mine. Uh, so that's kind of a physical or tangible asset. It's like a physical ownership. Uh, it's a physical object. Usually uh, the might as well interpret in a non-so physical uh uh, assets as well, uh, but the easiest to to imagine uh, that we have something physical. Uh, then I can I can give to somebody my Apple, for instance. That's kind of a physical transfer or physical ownership. Uh, and then basically, what I have is is like the physics. So that's the physical settlement layer. So if we have blockchain or cryptographic tokens, I would say that's a third category. Uh, we got something which is a token practically. Again, it's a poker chip on the blockchain. Uh, and then we have it like a cryptographic ownership. So I can do something with my, my poker chip if I have my private key and if I can sign a transaction of doing something uh, with that token practically. And then anything uh, practically the easiest way is like, is like transaction or a transfer of ownership is, is settled by the blockchain itself. So the point is uh, that, I mean, the question is, is usually the connection between these three SF representations. And I'm not gonna cover the, the connection between, between the legal and institutional or physical or tangible uh, ownership, because there are like 2000 years of history uh, of doing it. Uh, so if I, if I have my Apple, but I sign my contract that I sell my Apple to somebody and I, and I don't do it, then, so there's like 2000 years of experience, uh, what can be done. But the point is that the world is missing pretty much the experience, how, how blockchain uh, token, how cryptographic ownership uh, can be combined with, with legal and institutional one, and how this cryptographic and blockchain uh, representation, asset representation, It sounds like Daniel just dropped for a second. He'll be back on. As he was saying, his internet connection is a little uh, uh, spotty. So that was that was the coffee break. It it wasn't taking long. <laughs> okay, awesome. Uh, so one big area is basically uh, how we can combine kind of a legal or institutional uh, representation of an asset uh, with a blockchain and, and cryptographic one. <laughs> and so I would say there are like two, two big directions. One big direction is, is from the crypto anarchist world. So we got like, we got like ICOs or STOs or stuff like that. And then some of our, of, of, of our tokens uh, that, that we issue are, are legally characterized as, as securities, for instance, or the legal status 
of, of some of our blockchain tokens are, are not clear. So that's one direction uh, that's from the blockchain world to the legal institutional one. Uh, and then what's, what's going on in this field is, of course, the crypto and token regulation, uh, which is happening slowly, but it's happening. So like different uh, security token legal uh, or laws, it's like in the European Union, it's like the, the MIC or MICA regulation, uh, which is happening. Then you get something in, in Luxembourg. I, I think it's Luxembourg Token Act. If I'm not mistaken, uh, there's like regulation attempts in Switzerland as well. So that's that's one big area of 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 improvement, I would say. But perhaps there's another way as well, which might be interesting, and that's from the legal and institutional point of view. Uh, and it's an emerging field. So I mean, for instance, um, some fields like how we can we can tokenize a classical stock in a company and sell this stock on like crypto exchanges, uh, for instance, or how we can practically have a classical classical bond, so classical financial security, and issue this classical financial security as a blockchain token and practically move and sell it in, in different, uh, perhaps not decentralized, but like crypto exchanges. So that's a, that's a, that's a very interesting other uh, other initiatives. It comes from the legal institutional point of view, and some of these classical legal institutional asset representations are being tokenized. Uh, just some hints. Uh, so from a technical, so this is more like a, a legal question. Uh, from a technical point of view, it's it's not necessarily impossible uh, to 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 put a contract uh, beyond your uh, beyond your token so to put to put a legal contract beyond your token uh what you need to do uh you need to somehow bind basically your token with a legal text or legal prose uh that should be somehow linked to the token usually it is not stored directly on the blockchain but instead it is combined with some some hash links uh, hash pointers uh, what you need to do is, uh, which most blockchain doesn't do, but you need to somehow combine uh, legally binding digital signatures um, with your scheme, um, and then work. My, I mean, these things things might work. Uh, for instance, uh, and there are even special special ledgers like the R three ledger, uh, R three quarter ledger, uh, which doesn't really do directly like tokenization, but like like handling contracts and the classical classical uh um, legal contracts practically so from a technical point of view this is not impossible uh from the legal point of view yeah i see i think we're gonna see a lot of improvement in the in the coming years so on the other hand uh we can combine some connections between our cryptographical blockchain token and with with the physical world or with the physical asset uh and then it has a lot of initiatives uh, which practically differs very strongly uh, based on the based on the use cases. So, like I got some examples here. Uh, we can have like like IoT integrations uh, uh, with like a lock on a house or a, or a car. So, if I get my token actually owning that car or owning that that house, then I can unlock the door of that house or of that car practically then there's strong initiatives in like tokenizing supply chains if you tokenize supply chains of course you, you got like tangible assets so it's important that you know i mean if your tech, token really moves on the blockchain it should be moved uh, basically the i mean the physical asset should be uh should be somehow cover this movement as well then one interesting things again i said here like physical tangible but like if we have like like not so physical or not so tangible assets uh, despite we we might as well speak about like like the connection uh, or on such connection. So for instance, if we just uh, tokenize green bonds, for instance, then um, it is an interesting question. If I mean, if this if this green bond is really green, or or is it just kind of a greenwashing? If I'm not mistaken, that's the official word. Sometimes 
Uh, so, uh, for instance, one idea might be, which goes a little bit to this, to this physical, tangible, and cryptographical connection, is that if we have a green bond, uh, then we might as well combine it with open, transparent emission data, perhaps on the blockchain as well. So we can really prove that basically, I mean, we can prove in a transparent way that, that our green bond is really green, for instance. That's one idea. Um, then another idea, if you like tokenized securities, again, bonds or, or even stocks, then we might as well have a payout um, at each month or at the end of the year. So this, this payout can be basically programmed as well. Uh, it can be on the blockchain as well. And last but not least, one example, if we, if we just imagine like tokenized stocks, uh, in stocks, there's a, there's a voting mechanism and this voting mechanism can be actually realized, realized by the blockchain as well uh, with like governance tokens. And then uh, that means that the, that, the, uh, that the voting mechanism of a stock, which is actually not so much tangible, but despite the voting mechanism is controlled by the blockchain and perhaps it's open, it's permission, it's not so permissionless, but it's actually permission, but it's, it's transparent uh, pretty much. So these are the, like the three, three big asset representations. Uh, and then again, it's gonna be, I mean, there there can be a lot of uh, things discussed here basically. Uh, and I think I'm sure we're gonna see a lot of innovations uh, in these fields as well. So let me just continue. And basically as we have like, like many different tokens, uh, it's an important thing to have some, some hierarchy, some structure uh, with these tokens. Uh, and for this structure, for this hierarchy, or hierarchical or structural attempts, there are two big uh, ways of singing. I mean, one, of course, the token standards. So let me just try somehow, perhaps not fully standardized, but at least par partially standardized, different kind of tokens that can be used in different fields. And one big initiative is the ERC style standards. These are like the ERC20, uh, 223, and so on uh, tokens. Uh, this initiative comes from the uh, from the Ethereum Solidity World. Uh, and so, for instance, it's like, I don't know if I have the slide, but I might as well have it. So, for instance, it's important to know that basically uh, these standards try to describe somehow the core functionalities of a, of a, of a token. Uh, in terms of signatures. So this is like an ERC20 token. Basically what we got here is functionality. And then it says only we need to have a functionality like transfer, e-transfers token from one address to another one. It doesn't say much from the, uh, from the implementation uh, beyond basically. So this is one big attempt. I'm I'm sure you're familiar with that. And there are many many token standards. I would say uh, it's important to distinguish like a little bit these standards. Uh, there are ERC token standards which are more technical. So like for instance, an ERC two hundred twenty three is an interesting token standard. It prevents accidental uh, transfer of tokens, but it's more technical. So it's not necessarily something which is which is very important for for designing business applications on a tokenized basis or 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 for planning tokens for for business scenarios and we got com uh, we got tokens as well which are more important uh in different business scenarios it's like for nfts uh for subscription uh, models and stuff like that there's another initiative as well uh for characterizing tokens or token structures. And that's called the token taxonomy. Uh, it's an open source repo. If I can change, basically, uh, you find it basically on GitHub. Uh, and somehow the idea is uh, that there's a kind of a, a fancy syntax behind uh, with that you can describe somehow core functionalities of your token. So this is like a very simple example of this uh, of this fancy syntax. So you can have like base basic token types. These are like fungible and non fungible tokens. These are the major types. You can have some behaviors. That's like how these tokens acting in different situations in different scenarios. You can even have like 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 behavior groups. 
uh, and then you can have like properties, for instance, and everything is just abbreviated uh, with some some such uh, fancy. Um, it's it's like I don't know. It's it's like a mathematical formula, basically something uh, something similar. Uh, there's even support uh, for this token taxonomy framework, so you can install. Uh, that's practically a Visual Studio add-in, uh, which supports this token taxonomy framework. And then here you have like many examples of basic token types of behaviors, like for instance, there's a delegate, uh, there's an issue, there's there's a mean table functionality and stuff like that. These are or or like uh, different behaviors. Then you can have like behavior groups, and then you can have like like properties. For instance, if that's kind of a carbon token, then basically uh, you can have a couple of predefined uh, properties for for carbon emissions, for instance, and so. So at the end, you, you, you find something similar, which is a designer. So basically you can somehow design your token in a way that you find. So this is like a kind of a special fractional fungible token. And then it has some properties which measures carbon emissions or which aggregates carbon emissions. And then some, some behavior that are functions that do like you can transfer this token you can, I don't know, uh, it's divisible. Uh, you can enumerate. I'm not quite sure actually uh, all of this, but this is somehow your your design token in a way. So that's the second approach. Uh, that's the so-called token taxonomy framework. Again, it's a GitHub repo. Unfortunately, it's it's not much used, or I would say it's it's not much used publicly. So. Uh, so I mean, the repository is is itself open source, and you find you find Visual Studio plugins as well. But if you just check basically the literature of of public tokens, you don't find you don't find many many examples. So if you if you're looking for a, I don't know fractional ownership and non fungible token, then then you're gonna find these classical ERC standards, and you and you don't find like like implementation uh, based on the token taxonomy framework. Uh, which is a surprising fact. It it might it might be developed uh, in the long run, but at the moment, I would say uh, these token standards are pretty much driven by the by the ERC uh, style style standards. So what I'm gonna have in the in the in the next couple of slides, I will just highlight uh, some interesting token types. And again, it's uh, these token types are based on basically the ERC standards. Uh, because again, uh, you find you find mostly mostly these things um, in the in the literature or not literature, but but on the net. So if you just find the uh, most I don't know interesting token types, and if you just Google it, uh, you don't find like token tax taxonomy framework, but you probably find some some ERC standards. So these are the basic token types. Again, as I promised, just one slide. We got like two major categories. One is like fungible, second one is non-fungible. Uh, in fungible, uh, one token is, is identical with another one. Uh, so it's it should behave the same way as another one. It's like, for instance, cryptocurrency or, or card. Organize water in a river, for instance. Uh, then, then one liter of water should behave exactly the same way as another liter. Uh, so that's like fungible token. Non-fungible token. Uh, in non-fungible token, that's NFT. Uh, in NFT, each token is different. So, so one token is 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 not the same as another one. Uh, absolutely, absolutely different. Classical example: If you tokenize like fine art, if you tokenize fine art, then if you if you have one token for Mona Lisa and one token for Picasso, the Mona Lisa is is certainly not not the same as Picasso. Uh, so they are just two totally different things. Uh, this is the idea of of NFT non fungible tokens. Uh, and we got like hybrid tokens as well. Uh, many different hybrid tokens. Uh, the classical hybrid tokens is like. Uh, is like a combination of fungible and non-fungible tokens. Uh, it's uh, it's like um, if you have like, for instance, a role-playing game, 
um, in a role playing game, let me just imagine uh, we got swords and shields. And basically, uh, swords, we got like 1,000 swords and 1,000 shields. Uh, so basically, let me just imagine these are two categories. Uh, and the categories uh, between between each other. So one category, one item of one category, is is not exchanging is not the same as another item in another category. So a shield is not the same as a sword, for instance. But the items in a category uh, are are exchangeable, are interchangeable. So you can you can exchange one sword with another one. One sword should behave exactly the same way as another one. Similarly, I mean, if you if you got the shields shields behave the same way one shield is exactly the same as another other one so that's the idea of hybrid tokens for instance that's like erc 1155 you get categories of of tokens and then the categories are interchangeable are the same in one category but they are not the same among two categories so these are the basics and let me just cover some some more interesting kind of 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 fancy uh, fancy token types so one type is a special nft it's it's like a crypto badge or it's an nft badge uh it's like it's token uh for instance if i if i uh, if i accomplish something practically in a game i might get a badge that i'm the hero of the game uh but we can imagine like and that's that's my badge that's my that's my nft it's something which is not transferable so i if i'm the hero of the game i can't just sell this hero of the game to to anybody um the other example uh it's more classical if you think of like if i get a degree uh, from a university i get a master degree or a bachelor degree from a university uh that's that's kind of a token which is just mine so it is minted for me uh, but I can't give this master degree to anybody. I can't transfer it to anybody. It's it's just uh, like a badge, uh, one one thing just for me. So crypto NFT badge is practically a token that can be issued but cannot be transferred. Uh, it cannot even be burned uh, normally. Uh, so it might be used. I mean, despite in most of the scenarios, it might be used in special scenarios. Despite like in staking uh, stack, staking scenarios. Uh, one other example, it can be something as as reputation. So usually, uh, like for instance, if I if I get reputation in in some word, then it's it's reputation is not usually not something which which can be transferred. Uh, for instance, so if you think re a reputation, then it might not even be a, an NFT. It might be actually which is a, like a fungible badge uh, in some sense. Um, it can be like experience point in a game, academic de degree, subscription, and so on and so on. So it can be fungible and non-fungible as well. Uh, one interesting thing is actually we got we got something similar in a non non-tokenized way uh, on blockchain. So like if you think of issuing degrees uh, like diplom diplomas on a blockchain, then the classical approach approach is is like verifiable credential. Uh, that's that's not exactly the same, but it's used in a pretty similar manner. So it's an interesting question how like a like an NFT badge might be combined with like a, with like a blockchain and identity stack uh, with like a verifiable credential. Anyway, there's a standard uh, for crypto for NFT badges. Uh, that's the non-transferable, non-fungible tokens, for instance. And that's the ERC-1238, uh, uh, which should be a, here. Uh, it's actually a proposition. Uh, it doesn't say much. It says uh, take like classical tokens uh, if it's NFT and NFT, but again, it might be something which is an ERC twenty, and just uh, just 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 cancel basically the transfer function, or uh, just uh, just keep the transfer and mean functions. Um, so the next one is something similar. It's like a soul soul so called soul bond token. Uh, it's again kind of a crypto badge, uh, but it's not bound to to anybody, but it's bound to another non fungible token, to another NFT. Uh, so again, it is minted, uh, but it cannot be transferred or moved uh, once this stuff is minted. Uh, and the idea is here basically uh, that that, that soul bond tokens are like badges, but they are not necessarily bound to humans, uh, but they they can be bound to 
to like a persona and persona is might be might be somebody might be a group of people might be even a, even a machine um so we we cannot really represent this one on the blockchain uh so what we do we represent this persona with another nft and we associate uh with this nft persona a crypto batch uh, for instance that's the so-called soul bond uh, badge, uh, basically. And then we got one initiative for that. It's like the uh, EIP 5114. Uh, it's again, it can be found on the blockchain. It's a soul bond badge. And you got some, some deep description, uh, basically. Again, it's it's not so fancy. Basically, what you do, you skip most of the transfer functions um, of basically of a, of, a, of a, any kind of standard NFT token. So it's based on based on eleven uh, uh, ERC uh, seven hundred twenty one. So let's see some more exciting stuff. We got one NFT, uh, which is kind of a rentable NFT. Uh, so the idea, basically, in an NFT. Uh, we got the NFT and basically we can transfer the ownership. Uh, but it might happen that we just we just want to we just want to let somebody use this NFT for a certain period of time, but without basically uh transferring the ownership of this token. Um so for instance, if I got a car, uh that car is mine, uh I represent it with a token but I might let somebody uh, use my car. Um, I might even rent it pra uh, practically, so somebody can use this car, but only for a certain certain period of time. And that's the idea of, of rentable NFT. Uh, we got usually an additional role, a user, which can be granted uh, and then for, for, a, for a certain period of, of, of time. And then uh, this grant, this, this rentable granting uh, will expire after some times. Uh, so that's the idea, and we got the token standard for that as well. That's ERC uh, 497. Uh, that's the rentable token standard. So I hope I have it. Theoretically, that should be that should be my rentable. Uh, that should be my rentable uh, token type. And again, so it, it's not much. Basically, it's just some core functionalities. Uh, we just have here actually the major functionalities. Uh, so what I can do, I can set a user basically for a token. So if I own that token, I can set that a certain user, which is of course a certain address for this certain token, can use my token for a certain a period of time. And what does what does that exactly mean? Uh, that depends on the use case and depends depends on the implementation. So we we might as well imagine if. If, for instance, my token can open the 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 uh, the door of a car, and or I, I can drive the car with my token, then then the logic should be something similar. That basically, if I own that car, or if I just got uh, practically some kind of a usage for that car, then I can drive drive my car. Okay, but basically, basically this is the core functionality, and then we got some some query functions as well, like for instance. I can ask uh, if somebody uses basically a token. I can ask basically if if the usage exp or when the usage expires, and basically I can update that uh, that user as well, um, especially the uh, the the expiration the, uh, date, for instance. So that's the runtable NFT, and things are getting more complicated. So we can have something as composable NFT. So the idea of composable NFT, uh, let me have like like a role playing game where we have like a character, like for instance a, a knight, uh, practically, and this this knight is an NFT, but that NFT has like several items. It has like shields, uh, swords. Uh, it has an armor as well, and so on and so. On. So practically, uh, my character NFT. Um, and we can imagine that, I mean, these, these items, my sword, my shield, and stuff like that are tokenized as well. So practically, I would assume that if I just sell my, my knight, my character, then it should, or transfer my, my knight, my, my, uh, my character, 
it should work that way that I sell or transfer basically all of the items of that character. So that's the major idea basically of a composable NFT. You can see like uh, this is like the uh, this is like the the crypto punks, and then there was basically um, one one other combination of this this crypto punk hats. There was a team that designed basically body uh, for this crypto punk hat, and then basically it was like like an NFT which contained like two NFTs, for instance, and then uh, it could be handled as as one basically one big NFT. Uh, it's important to know that I mean composable NFT is pretty complicated. It has it has many different scenarios. It has like at least four different versions. Uh, it can maintain child tokens in a bottom-up manner. It can manner, it can handle child tokens in a top-down composable manner. Uh, we can imagine that an NFT has like like other NFTs, like other ERC seven hundred twenty-one tokens as child elements, and we can imagine that basically it has like like fungible tokens as child elements. Uh, like for instance, we can even imagine that it has like 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 hybrid tokens as child elements. Uh, like for instance, uh, with, the, with, the, with the sword and shield example and knight example. We got one standard for this composable uh, NFT. It's like ERC-998. Uh, and then, uh, so perhaps I have some more other, no, that's already something similar. So it's it's pretty complicated. It's actually like four different items. Uh, depending if you if you compose these tokens in a top down or in a bottom bottom up manner, and if you combine like with uh, with other NFTs or other uh, other uh, fungible tokens. So we got the other direction as well. Uh, that's like fractional NFT. Fractional NFT <coughs> looks that way. Uh, that we got something uh, which is an NFT and. Well, I would say at the moment the hype is a little bit like over, but like in the in the bubble, like uh, like years ago, some some NFTs uh, were pretty expensive. Uh, or we can imagine that we have something as a Mona Lisa, which we would some somehow uh, tokenize as an NFT. That's a pretty expensive NFT. So we can do something similar that we tokenize this NFT uh, in many ways, uh, realizing kind of fractional ownership of that token, basically. Uh, so that's the idea. So fractional NFTs is a whole NFT that has been divided into smaller fractions, allowing different uh, uh, different numbers of people to claim uh, or own somehow this piece uh, piece of NFT. Uh, it's actually it has some some market advantages. Uh, the problem is with NFT is that uh, it's even if if it's like high value, uh, there's no liquidity on the market for NFTs. Um, so if you just make like fractional NFTs or FNFTs, then then these can be uh, traded as small pieces, so um, with small values. So it it makes it easier, like uh, demo, uh, democratizing basically your your NFT uh, as basically these are small pieces. Uh, it makes the price discovery easier, uh, and it gives more liquidity on the market. So there are like two different standards. Uh, one is the multi-fractional non-fungible tokens, and the other one is the refungible token standard. Uh, both work in a way. I'm not. So I got like three more use cases. Uh, I just try to speed up a little bit. One of the use cases is like NFT royalty. Uh, NFT royalty is it looks that way basically. If if you are a crea creator and you sell your NFT, you get some money, but you might as well want to get some some royalty if somebody sells further your uh, your NFT, and that's what NFT royalty does. Uh, it's pretty simple, actually. Um, it it can, can can't be re really be standardized very much uh, because because NFT royalty depends heavily on the on the NFT marketplaces, and there are many incompatible implementations. Um, so what NFT royalty standard does 
it it has the very simple functions with that you can query uh, how much royalty should be paid and to what address and basically uh, it's standardized in a way but basically it depends on the nft marketplaces if, if that is implemented in a correct way uh let me just show basically i think i have it open so it looks that way uh so that's it basically that's one function that's a royalty info function uh which is a token id and, uh, and and the sale price and based on that stuff uh there's some information returning who should who should get how much uh, how much uh, uh, amount of of royalty basically so we had a lot of like nft style uh, use cases or token standards probably it's it's book it's because of the hype of nft uh, but we have some 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 other interesting stuff as well and one is like the the subscription service so subscription service works that way uh that that it it implements somehow a subscription model on the top of the blockchain so kind of a recurring uh, payment uh it means that if if you like i don't know if you just subscribe to a service and you want to do it in a blockchain manner uh uh what you as a provider want to do uh is to is to get a get a small amount of money uh, which is a small amount of fungible token in every uh, period of time time frame so what these token standards do basically um they have like like two functionalities one is a special allow uh so user of a token holder uh or a token holder can all allow that a certain provider can be through a certain amount of token in a certain amount of time frame. So, like for instance, uh one die in every month, for instance, uh, if I if I just subscribe to a service. And then we got the provider as well, and the provider based on this uh, allowance can basically be through like one die every month, uh, practically. And what's important, user can of course cancel subscription in, in, in any time. So there's a standard for that. That's like the ERC 900 uh 48. Uh, you can find the idea basically on the blockchain as well. Uh, sorry, on, on GitHub as well. Uh, sometimes these things are not really, uh, I mean, fully cre fully created uh, proposals. Uh, just some uh, GitHub uh, GitHub links. Uh, but basically, that's the idea. It's like two functions. First is like special improvement, uh, making possible to withdraw certain amount of tokens in a certain time frame and and cancel this of course uh and the other one is like the the exact transfer the exact withdraw uh of that kind of uh of that kind of amount of money so things are getting more complicated as we eat the 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 fully legal uh or the initiatives for creating fully legal to legal tokens on the blockchain and one one such initiative is the security so-called security tokens uh so security tokens is an attempt or was an attempt actually it was created like three years ago uh, so much not much heard about that uh since then that but i mean so again it might be improve improving uh security tokens is a special token which has some some controlled functionality so basically you can whitelist and you can blacklist accounts transfers tokens or amount of tokens you can freeze uh, you can look up uh, uh, lock tokens practically or you can you can make limitations in, in transfer of, of amounts for instance uh, that's the idea uh, basically it, it usually looks that way it has some some internal function which is a verify transfer so verify transfer can be given to to any kind of uh legalized institutes it can be realized on chain as well and basically uh each transfer can be validated based on this verify transfer so if it's if it's good uh from all kind of kyc ml point of view then it can be executed otherwise it can't be executed and then we get some detect transfer access that uh, restriction uh it's again it's just from to and amount it does the same thing basically uh it causes this verified transfers it gives back if a certain amount of uh uh of token transfer from one from one account to another one can be executed or cannot be executed uh so this is like the erc 14 4 
which is a simple so-called restricted token standard, but that was the idea uh, basically for a, uh, for a basic security token standard as well. Again, it is just two public uh, functions. One is the so-called detect, detect transfer restriction. Uh, again, it gives back if, if a transfer from an address to an address in a certain value can be executed or not. And the second one is, is a message, is a message for this, for this restriction. So if that restriction uh, cannot be executed, then what's the reason for that? And everything uh, which is an implementation is behind the hoods. Again, usually there are some regulated institutes having like certain rules, even in a non-chain form. And then basically they can like uh, control everything uh, in the token. So these are the security tokens initiatives. Actually, there's not just one, but like uh, three different initiatives at least. And last but not least, uh, there's a so-called token for regulated exchanges initiative. Uh, it's it's sometimes called as as T-Rex as well, uh, because it's a it's a pretty pretty big dinosaur. Uh, it defines standard interfaces for security tokens on Ethereum, uh, which are which are which can be fully regulated uh, or which can be which can be used in a fully controlled manner practically. So there are many such uh, control mechanisms. Uh, there's like transfer restrictions, uh, there's some upgradability, there's some requirement for identity management. Uh, it's of course a kind of a permissioned uh, ERC20 token, so permissioned fungible token. Uh, there are conditional transfers, uh, there are even things for or requirements for, for wallet rec recovery and stuff like that. And for that, there's one proposition that's the uh, 3643, which is again, uh, not so simple, but pretty complicated. Uh, it has a lot of uh, requirements, uh, what, should be, what should be possible in a fully, or with a fully regulated uh, security tokens. So these are some of the requirements, uh, like for instance, there should be an on-chain verification, uh, there should be uh, account or private key recovery defined, there should be like freeze tokens, there should be the possibility to pose a token um, and so on and so force transfers and so on and so on. So again, it's called like T-Rex uh, because uh, it's like a big dinosaur. And again, it has like many interfaces. So I would say that was my presentation. Uh, it was taking a little bit longer than I expected, but it is usually that's the case. Uh, so I'm sure they're gonna be, so, I mean, based on the first, you know, I mean, search, I found these exciting token types, but I'm sure there are plenty more. Uh, that's not a question. And then again, uh, this field, is getting to be more and more and more important, and I'm sure we're gonna see like more and more uh, direct or explicitly uh, formalized token types and token standards in the future. So I would stop my monologue here, and then uh, I would just uh, go through on the questions, or if you have any questions, comments uh, related uh, to my presentation or tokens, or actually to Hyperledger. I uh, just just feel free to unmute yourself and just 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 ask the question. Otherwise, I'm just browsing basically the the questions. Yeah, there's one one thing. Uh, uh it's gonna be streamed on on YouTube. As far as I know, you will find basically under under Hyperledger Fabric in YouTube. Uh, there's gonna be a recording as well, and I will share the slides. Yeah, uh, yeah so, again, sorry for my internet. It's just a little bit buggy sometimes. Mm. So I'm just browsing the questions. If I see if I see anything which is like a you know, more more general question, uh, but again, uh, as I see, there are many comments. Um, so 
So uh, if you if you don't don't want to wait for me until I until I reach reach your comment or, or question, uh, again just just feel free to unmute yourself and just just ask a question. So I, I don't know. I'm just browsing the questions, uh, but it's uh, more like uh, uh, so. I would say for some of the questions, uh, it's just easier. Uh, I'm I'm gonna just share this presentation, and then basically you will find all the links uh, of all the token standards uh, basically on my presentation uh so so it's gonna be a good starting point uh basically uh if you just need like further research uh just one comment from from my side uh uh so i mean this whole tokenization process looks like a little bit um uh, if if the market is on hype uh there are like many many attempts uh and many good initiatives if the market is down um these in initiatives sometimes just just to it, I mean, go down. Um, or no, or I wouldn't say nobody interest, but you know, I mean, especially if there's if there's like, uh, for instance, a crypto winter, uh, then people just uh, don't care much much about these things. Uh, but nevertheless, I would say uh, so. It's interesting to to take a look on these standards uh, because I mean, supposing you're you're like, I mean, design basically a system uh, which. Uh, which uses such tokens it's it's just just way better to start with something uh which is already which is already fine and already ready uh or at least you know i mean i mean half ready or something um otherwise uh, otherwise it's just more more difficult and 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 need, need to uh, people need to have uh, like like more brainstorming uh, uh so uh that's why I think it's always a good idea to have like uh, like like such such an explicit list. Uh, I have like a couple of questions uh, related to to legal uh, legal questions. I'm, I'm unfortunately I'm not a lawyer. I, I have mostly a technical background and some some. So I uh, just uh, once again some connection issues, but actually I think we got like five more minutes and nothing and no more. So perhaps one important. So uh, sure, uh, just go ahead. Yes. Do you have any um, uh, insight or resources into crypto economics 
So, you know, you, let's say you have a token or you, you create a token and you distribute it out to your community. Um, is there any sort of writing or any sort of research or anything about how, how the economics works um, of that, of that uh, sort of mini economy that you've created, if that makes sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I, I can't, I don't have at the moment like resources, uh, uh, but for instance, I saw like a couple of uh, uh, practical and research papers as well. Uh, it's like uh, one, one practical uh, consideration was like, uh, like how to like, to do like an ICO in a way that the uh, that the price won't collapse practically right away. Uh, it had some co some considerations uh, for how much time you should practically lock your lock your token before it can be it can be pushed to, to the market, and then um, it 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 might be uh, pushed to the market. Not everything in in one one round, but somehow in a step by step basis. Uh, so I saw some some practical considerations in that direction, and I I saw some uh, some theoretical investigations as well. Uh, it was more like in in terms of DeFi. So so like in terms of DeFi, um, there were some analyses for certain protocols, if I'm not mistaken, for like like synthetic styles protocols. So it's like uh, if you have a collateral, and based on the collateral. You create like a loan position, which is either a stable coin or like a synthetic asset, uh, and the and the problem might arise that if your collateralized collateral is a token that you issued, so it might be uh, might be vulnerable uh, for for supply demand attacks. Uh, I saw some some research papers on that direction, uh, but that's an interesting topic of especially especially in in terms of like DeFi. A DeFi, a DeFi uh, complex DeFi protocol uh, contains of contains of many tokens, and each of the, these tokens can be actually uh, vulnerable for supply demand shocks, uh, which is kind of an economic attack. Uh, there, there are some some published uh, attacks as well. Uh, for instance, with flash loans, um, and flash loan is typically something. Uh, so, if you attack protocol like with flash loan. It's it's usually works. Uh, it usually works that way that you do kind of a supply demand shock uh, on your on your protocol. Uh, so that's a in, very interesting topic. Uh, I can't mention right now. I have to research a little bit, but I would say uh, this is a real field uh, which is which is which is very very much underdeveloped. Uh, especially if you want complex application containing tokens uh, and then security doesn't only contain something uh, which is technical security but it contains like economical security of your token uh, of your of your protocol for instance and I mean with that that your protocol can't be go wrong even if for some of your tokens as building blocks there's there's like a supply and demand shock um, so that's a very interesting field and I would say probably the scientific world needs like I don't know uh, 10, 10 more years to to analyze all of the DeFi protocols that are running on the all of the tokenized protocols that are running at the moment on the internet and identify all of the all of the possible um, so so or such economical uh, vulner vulnerabilities. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I I'm I'm looking for practical examples of who's done it. Uh, you know, and what their experience has been, and you know what the pitfalls are, and um, yeah, and yeah, so, I, I agree, it's pretty early, you yeah. know. So, like for instance, as as far as I remember, uh, like uh, like the uh, like one investigation, I think that was that was like from from Berkeley, uh, having again uh, this paper, uh, it's kind of a collateral based lending protocol or stable stable cryptocurrency or or synthetic asset but it's it's an over collateralized debt position so they investigated in a scientific paper what happens if that if that collateral um, has some some supply demand shocks a uh, shock and then they they identify that if that collateral is practically um, 
so so it it can basically the collapse collapse of the price of the collateral uh can cause basically like a vicious circle uh which causes like more liquidation and pushes eventually uh that down uh the price even more so basically it might cause in the in the total collapse of certain protocols uh that's that was i think from from university berkeley uh i read like one one such paper uh but again it's it's for very very specific protocols and very specific analysis uh, so i would welcome if if there's you know i mean i mean general framework of of investigating these topics uh but it's again it's it's very interesting and it, it's it will i mean it must be used i mean just just imagine uh we speak about like like tokenized applications uh and then and then one issue is that i mean tokens are probably running publicly on a blockchain so they can be hacked uh but another issue is is the is the is the economics of the of the tokens doesn't work for some reason then basically uh it can it can be hacked from an economical point of view so i think the other example is like the like the collapse of 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 terra luna uh that was uh that was actually the result as well uh that that the that the system was probably attack, attacked from a, from an economical point of view in a in a time period uh i mean that 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 used basically a stabilizing mechanism uh which is kind of a senior ash share and then senior ash share works if there's liquidity on the market so if the price collapses in a in a time frame when there's no when there's no uh, uh no liquidity on the senior ash token market then the full scheme can can actually collapse and something similar happened happened with with terra luna so it's again that's very interesting but you know i just have some some hints i don't know uh i don't know like general frameworks or i i don't have general general answers yes uh yeah the economic uh principles uh, are very interesting but uh yeah thank you thank you very much for this presentation it was uh I really enjoyed it. I'll I'll connect with you on LinkedIn. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, perhaps uh, I'm just browsing the question. One 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 thing which which might be important. Uh, it's an emerging field as well. Uh, that like, and it's again I said like 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 tokenization and the underlying blockchain or settlement layer are two independent things not necessary so there's like initiatives where they are con combined at the moment uh, and this is like layer two scaling for instance so some of the examples that i mentioned here like like subscription or recurring payment uh that can be actually much better uh much better uh realized if if the underlying protocol is not the blockchain but kind of a layer two protocol uh, if you have questions just just unmute yourself just go ahead and then just do it. Okay. So I didn't understand the retotonication. Re I'm not quite sure which which one do you mean? Yeah, the retonication. Re yeah. So the recording, the recording payment. Uh, yeah, I didn't understand that part. Please. So could you give an example, maybe? yeah sure uh so Thank actually you. the idea is that you know i mean we got like alice and alice and we got like bob that's like alice that's like bob so that's the classical example and let me see let me think that you know i mean what bob does he has a video server basically and what Alice does, he want to, uh, she want to watch videos. Uh, so these are like watch videos. So uh, that's basically the best realized by by a, by a subscription. So she subscribes for this video watching service, which looks that way that like she pays like I don't know, ten die each month. Uh, that's like a classical subscription service. So it looks that way that basically that's like a that's like a subscription service or recurring payment. Uh, she she should, I mean, sorry, the direction is the other one, but actually she should pay uh, $10 basically for each month uh, 
for both. So that's like 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. So the question is how that can be supported in, in blockchain. And that's like the kind of blockchain subscription service, which looks that way, you get a special improvement. And then Alice will call basically an improvement, which is a kind of a time frame improvement. Uh, she allows for Bob uh, to, to withdraw from her account 10, 10 die, for instance, each month. So that's an approve, basically. Uh, she approves for a certain time frame, a certain amount, and for somebody. So for Bob, for instance, that's like the recipient, for instance. And if that happens, basically, then what Bob can do, uh, he calls like transfer from. It's uh, pretty similar as, as a similar uh, from. Uh, and basically, he can transfer from Alice's account uh, $10 in each month. Uh, but basically, it differs from a classical, uh, you know, approve and, and transfer function uh, because, uh, because it has a time frame uh, and it has an amount as well for that time frame. Um, so that's like a very simple implementation of, uh, of a subscription, of, a, of an on chain subscription service. So that's okay. the main idea. Yeah, I mean, okay, thank you very much. I mean, the presentation was awesome. Okay. Uh, I mean, you can check more. We can check more on the standards. Basically, it, it doesn't say much more. That's like the ERC uh, 948. Uh, so it's not necessary. You know, I mean, it won't solve all of your problems. Uh, let me put it that way. Uh, but it gives at least some, at least some, 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 some initial uh possible solutions uh how how such a problem can be solved uh basically on chain uh, for instance this is one example this is an on chain solution for that on chain solutions for for recurring payment for subscription service is not optimal i would say amples which might be considered rather rather with some some layer two solutions okay okay and then I make I'm making a a paper for my university uh, in blockchain. And is it possible to make an interview to you, maybe? Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, let me just connect with each other. Uh, I'm the best reachable via LinkedIn. Uh, so if you just connect me uh, in LinkedIn, sure. Uh, Okay, we thank can, you. Can yeah, Thank you very much. Welcome. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure. I mean, there are many comments, but honestly, I'm I'm just not sure if I can cover everything. Uh so so my proposition would be if you if you have like question, uh just just go ahead and ask it. Uh So the uh, the PDF will be shared. Uh, yeah. Hello, Daniel. Um, thank uh, you very much for your presentation. I have a question about T-Rex. Because my understanding is that it can be used uh, to upload, like th there was a, a mention of uh, on-chain ID, like personal data information uh, put on chain. How are personal data uh, managed there? Because these are very private uh, data, and also, how can we make sure to? Because it, it cannot be it cannot be erased uh, over time. So, isn't it a regulatory issue on them or other systems to manage personal data? Uh, that the system should work with this protocol, which is on chain ID, and I'm not quite sure how it works. Uh, but there's some some initiative for for handling kind of a customer ID on chain. Uh, I don't know the details, uh, so we can uh, we can take a look, or you can take a look uh, after the call. Again, it's on chain ID. Uh, that's a blockchain initiative for for somehow storing IDs on the blockchain. 
I'm I'm sure they they don't write personal information into the blockchain. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I live in Europe, uh, so so G GDPR is a is a pretty tough thing. Uh, it it comes it comes out in each and every blockchain. You know, I mean, even considerations uh, that that you shouldn't write public or, or personal information into the blockchain. And there's even like different lists what can be regarded as personal information and what can't be regarded as as personal information. So again, I'm not quite sure how on chain ID works. Uh, probably it's an ID and and your personal information is not on chain, but uh, is with some 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 kind of a centralized database for instance with kind of a uh, regulated entity that that might be actually an idea uh but again i'm i'm sure they won't they don't they don't write personal information into the blockchain yeah it's it's just uh exactly so one interesting field is that i mean this is tokenization uh but there's another interesting field that's like combining uh the blockchain identity stack uh in such situations and that's that's exactly that's like verifiable credentials hyperledger in the end the iris and so on and so on they don't tokenize they they issue like verifiable credentials for instance so it might be a very interesting like ongoing uh research or even research and development uh how how such uh how the blockchain identity stack with like verifiable credentials can be uh, can be combined basically uh with with like a public blockchain token uh in a way so uh I would say, are there any more questions? Again, it's just the best if you just unmute yourself and ask it, uh, because I'm pretty much lost in the in the in the chat. Uh, so, so I, I I can't promise I I find uh, uh, your question if it is uh, you know very relevant. Uh, I can I will share the the slides uh, certainly. Uh, both on the YouTube channel, and I think it will be basically sent in uh, via email as well uh, from from Hyperledger, so you can see in the attachment uh, if you just uh, subscribed for uh, for one of the meetups uh, officially. So uh, I would say uh, we planned actually to to uh, one and a half hour uh, and it's it's getting to be over so i would say if there's no more questions then i would like to thank you very much for the participation i hope you heard some interesting points from me uh, i hope my my network connection wasn't so bad so I mean, at least partly my presentation was enjoyable. So again, uh, thank you very much for the participation and, and see you next time. Thanks, Daniel. That was great. Uh, um, and then if you want to send me the slides, like you said, I'll send it out to everybody who registered. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Great. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much.